Hello everyone, my name is Mishari Mukbil and I am here to give a presentation on inner source and anti-fragile teams. Originally, this was meant to be a live presentation at the Inner Source Summit 2022, but unfortunately, it seems that during that time, I would be on an island with spotty internet connections. So, so in order to play it safe, I had decided to record this video instead. However, if the internet holds, I hope to be there at the end of this uh, video for Q&A. A little bit about myself. I have been in the tech industry for over 25 years now and basically part of the open source movement during that time. I have had technical leadership roles from small startups to large organizations. And I am on the organizing team for Open Tech Summit Thailand, Thailand's only international open source conference, as well as FOSS Asia Singapore, arguably Asia's largest open source event. I am also the acting vice president of the Open Technology Association of Thailand that is soon to be registered. And for the last few years, I have been an inner source coach with the aims of bringing the, the joys of the open source way of working to in-house teams. For the last few months, I have been an East Asia consultant with Bitergian, and I am also a cacao farmer. So that would explain the, the farming analogies that I sometimes use. So what is anti-fragility exactly? The first time I heard of it, anti-fragility was a bit of a strange word because I had heard of fragility. But anti-fragility was an entirely new concept uh, for me. It seems that anti-fragility is a term that was de developed, possibly coined, by Nassim Nicholas Taleb, author of Fool by Randomness, Black Swan, and the book Anti-Fragile Things That Gain from Disorder. And in the book, he states, some things benefit from shocks. They thrive and grow when exposed to volatility, randomness, disorder, and stressors. Love, adventure, risk, and uncertainty. Yet, in spite of the ubiquity of the phenomenon, there is no word for the exact opposite of fragile. Let us call it anti-fragile. That's, that's an interesting concept because if you think about it, volatility, randomness, disorder, and stressors are things that are often not part of the corporate world but are generally very much part of the open source way of doing things. Taleb also continues to say that the anti-fragile loves randomness and uncertainty, which also means crucially a love of errors, a certain class of errors. This is also quite interesting because one of the reasons why you open code up as an open source project is to have errors exposed early. As Linus Torvald once says, more eyes makes bug shallow. And here we sort of start seeing where anti-fragility is applicable to open source as, and subsequently inner source. So a little bit more of an explanation, right? Teacups are fragile. If you disturb a teacup enough, it basically breaks, right? And muscle is anti-fragile. Stressing muscle makes it stronger up until a certain point. Teacups, they are static. They are eternally teacups up and until the time when they are disturbed enough, in which case they fall apart. Muscles, on the other hand, you can say it weakens in a static environment, but thrives in an environment where they are used a lot and exposed to a whole bunch of different random variables. And 
it works roughly like this. You have a stressor that is applied to muscles, say by lifting weights, right? The muscles then recover from the stress, becoming stronger in the process, and then being prepared for the next stress that is applied to it. However, the stress only applies up to a certain point Natu naturally. We don't want too much stress in your environment, but a nominal amount of stress that is within the bounds of what your muscles can handle is considered to be good. So from years of experience dealing with technical teams, I have realized that incentivizing complacent teams to have good hygiene is extremely challenging. For example, if you want to develop an onboarding process that is really, really effective, it is very, very difficult to do so when your teams have low turnover. One reason for that is because there is no feedback loop. You, you don't really know how effective your onboarding process is until you bring someone new onto the team. Just maybe okay if you are working in a startup and you are expanding like mad, but under normal uh, circumstances, it is not something that can be easily tested. Then there is the issue of knowledge siloed in individuals. Right? There is no need, real need to share. We have teams, for example, with the same group of programmers who have been there for, let's say, a decade, right? They, they become part of the inst institution and they don't feel that there is any need to share their code or their knowledge for that matter because they are, how should I put it? They are comfortable where they, uh, well, where they are and they know that the world can change around them and they may be temporary changes that affects them, but ultimately the organization will let them get back to doing what they do. There often seems to be a lack of consideration for nth order effects. Um, what this means is that the code runs, it may operate, but cause and effects are decoupled. You don't know what the effects of your code is going to be uh, down the road which makes debugging and testing a grueling effort. And another part of the problem is that the code doesn't need to be read by anyone else. So the quality of the code can be pretty bad. Often this is due to programmers having to write code under, under a tight deadline. But the fact that code doesn't need to be read by, by anyone else really disincentivizes you from writing high quality readable code. So let me tell you a story of a project that I got involved in a few years ago. I was called in to help an organization debug their project. It was a software development project that was handed over to an outsourced team and they weren't sure why the project was not getting delivered. So they asked me to come in and take a look and see if I could do something to help make the delivery faster. So I came in and miraculously, in retrospect, I got access to the subversion repository this was uh, in the days before Git. And I checked out the code and I realized that all the variable and function names were in a foreign language. Now with the help of Google Translate, thankfully I could start figuring things out. But then there was another problem. The contractors working on the code would not respond uh, they would not respond to my emails. They would not respond to my chat. They basically ignored me for, for days. And again, this goes back to the, uh, to the complacency. This is an, an extreme example, but 
why should the programmers talk to a consultant who has just come in and will probably soon be gone. So I was desperate. I wasn't sure what to do. That's when I decided to start checking in complete rubbish into the repository. Then all of a sudden, I started getting uh, chats and emails from the developers saying, don't do that. But you see what I did there, I applied stress to an otherwise stable system. And by doing so, I initiated a positive change. So how does inner source help? Well, with inner source, there is open communication. This exposes team to a variety of, of opinions and feedback. So you always know how your code is doing. If you write your code and something breaks, you and the person who is complaining about the code are essentially talking through the same channels, right? Instead of being filtered or buffered through a company's bureaucracy or management structure. And I think that this applies across a whole range of scenarios. By communication, I don't mean just a human to human communication, but also human to, com com to computer as well um, in the form of code. And the inner source culture enables teams to act positively. So with the feedback that you get, the culture allows you to take it positively. And then subsequently, it is incorporated into system design and the code. So if it was the situation that I had faced earlier, the team working on the code would have welcomed me as another contributor. And I would have been able to access all the past records as well as documentation about how the system was developed in order to be able to help complete its delivery. I mentioned just now about how inner source helps. Now I'm just going to talk a little bit about anti-fragility in the inner source maturity model, where you can see anti-fragile principles encoded in the, in the pattern. So first of all, collective decision-making. This removes a single point of failure in the decision-making process. Right? Collective decision-making is always a bit random, but it often proves to be very, very effective because then you benefit from the wisdom of others and you end up with something greater than the sum of its parts. The other thing is the sharing of stories. Success and failures are learned throughout the organization and this allows learning from failure. Again, you can't have anti-fragility without failure, without learning, without adapting and without being prepared for the next failure. Cross-functional teams, and this is also mentioned in the maturity model. But what this means is that issues are resolved holistically and the systematic improvement of function. Instead of your code and your design being optimized for a single unit. But what this also means is that the DNA of the code, the, the, the spirit of the code and its function is imprinted throughout the organization rather than existing in a single silo, which also leads to anti-fragility because in case of a shakeup of the organizations or of the teams for whatever reason, your organization will continue to function because of this, of this imprinting. The culture of inner source, being proactive in giving and receiving help, this really strengthens uh, as well, the organization. So this is an extremely short talk since I have only 15 minutes. I just wanted to make the case that inner source helps your team become anti-fragile. It does this by having your teams as much as possible having direct exposure to the stakeholders and receiving open and transparent feedback. 
This coupled with a culture of positive change, as well as the agency to mitigate risks and make improvements, lead to improvements. And that is where anti-fragility comes from. That concludes my talk. Uh, thank you very much for listening. If you have any questions, you can reach me at my email address through Macedon, my LinkedIn. And if the bird site is still functioning by the time you listen to this, my Twitter handle. Thank you very much.